Um, I'm Jill Rubio, I'm the director of the Work and Equalities Institute at the University of Manchester and I'm going to talk today on some work that's been published on the base, primarily on the basis of a, a project on reducing precarious work through, through social dialogue that was led by my colleague uh, Damien Grimshaw. Um, however, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the whole issue of social protection, social employment protection. Uh, but just to give you an introduction to the overall project, um, uh, the way in which we thought about looking at precarious work was to start by defining precarious work as a deficit with respect to protective gaps. Um, uh, and we defined that relative to the standard employment relationship. However, obviously there's some problems with that um, when you're doing comparative work. Um, um, and first of all, within countries, the actual nature of the standard employment relationship changes over time. And certainly across countries there are very different standards. Um, there are country varieties in standards and the form of regulation and the direction of change. So this is just to give you an idea of the complexity. It's not really what I'm going to be finally focusing on today, but just to clarify that we looked at th six different countries uh, which actually fitted in, um, provided variety on most of the major ways in which you might characterise national models. Uh, by the regulation of the SER, whether the male breadwinner norm, about labour market flexibility, and gaps in standards between employment forms. And in fact, my colleague Damien uh, did this summary of country relative standards, which suggests that actually standards of social protection between the different countries is highly variable and variable along different dimensions. I'm not going to go into this, but just to give you a flavour of that this is the, the comparative picture. I'm actually not going to be spending too much time on the comparison. I'll explain in a minute. Um, but just, again, some further things. We, we, we took the view that all work, all employment forms can have precarity associated with it. So we, um, some forms of full-time and permanent work can be precarious if it's low income, uh, low wage, um, part-time and variable hours, temporary and fixed agency, term agency and subcontracted, outsourced and posted, and posted workers and false self-employment. These were all covered by the project. Um, um, other studies um, have focused on non a lot of studies here of non-standard employment on objective and subjective job quality measures. But our institution analysis we considered complementary. We had a detailed focus on precarious work arising from four protective gaps. You know, there's employment rights gaps, social protection gaps, representation gaps, and enforcement gaps. Um, and these are interconnected and institutionally embedded. Uh, oh, I suppose our assumption is the widening of gaps makes ma labour markets more exclusive and closing of gaps makes labour markets more inclusive. But of course in a comparative context that's also problematic because you can have inclusive but low standards or exclusive and relatively higher standards. So again it's not simple. So just to give you again this is the final set of things as introduction. Um, these are the kinds of things we were looking at in terms of employment rights gaps, low minimum standards, exclusive eligibility to rights, irregular upgrading, weak integration between forms of employment. Um, on social protection we are looking at um, um, thresholds that um, inhibited either making contributions to social protection or getting benefits, whether it's hours of work, pay levels, job continuity and all those other kinds of things. We looked at representation, um, whether we have weak trade unions, exclusive eligibility for representation, for example, uh, excluding um, people in the same workplace but not of the same employer, and unequal involvement. And, enforce, I'm sorry, and enforcement gaps, uh, which include awareness of rights, uh, power and fear, power, um, power relationships, fear of trying to enforce gaps, uh, resources available uh, to enforce gaps, and coverage of enforcement agencies. So this is the overall, uh, overarching approach. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm going to do now is just narrow down on a, a very particular aspect, which has been published recently in the Work Employment Society Journal. Um, and what I'm looking um, in different, uh, um, that's a sort of wider issue about um, the development of non-standard employment and challenges and contradictions in that. What I'm going to do today is actually highlight or focus on issues of how we might extend employment and social protection to cover non-standard and 
and precarious workers. And I'm just going to focus, um, because we've limited time, on four possible strategies, which I've called reform, reduce, remedy, and revolutionize, if you like. Um, and reform policies are to extend eligibility or, or improve the value of benefits within the existing system for those in non-standard forms of employment. I'm using NSFE for that. Another strategy might be to reduce non-standard forms of employment in part by developing policies to ease retention or re-entry to standard employment relationship or, co or um, contracts. A third aspect might be to remedy the impact of non-standard forms of employment on things like living standards by providing in-work benefits for the low-paid and the insecure. And the fifth, uh, fourth is to revolutionise social protection by disconnecting employment status and um, uh, disconnecting it from employment status and implementing universal basic income, as Judy Fudge was discussing this morning. So this is what I'm going to be looking at. So let's starting with the reform. What I put on this slide is on the on the left hand side is what the aims of a reform might be. <clears throat> and I'm suggesting that you, one of the, the first aim might be to include um, uh, more of those employed in non standards of employment by reducing or abolishing thresholds for contributions and for eligibility. And on the right hand side, I'm providing some examples of where this has happened. So when I said I'm not really looking so much at the comparison, what I'm really doing is using these six countries to pull out good practice examples that other countries might learn from without actually saying that that country is overall a good practice example because some of these things may be offset in those particular countries by uh, not such progressive aspects. So I'm trying to pull out the progressive aspects of what could be done in order that other countries could learn for those without sort of saying this country is better overall than another country. So um, just to give some key examples from our cases then, for Spain, um, um, eligibility for redundancy payments for temporary employees started after one month, which was a much shorter period than in other countries. So that's one example of how you could bring more people in. OK, I know Spain has more people employed on very short contracts, so that counteracts that. But nevertheless, it's still a principle that we could apply. France um, is one example where they reduced the minimum earnings per quarter for eligibility from benefits from 200 to 150 minimum hourly wage earnings in a quarter of, employ uh, of um, in, in a three-month period. Again, making it easier for people to, con to qualify. In Denmark, as long as you, you are not very, very marginal part-time, you can opt to insure yourself as full-time. That's not, that costs you, but it's nevertheless uh, an option that doesn't exist in other countries. So that's the first thing. Then the second uh, aim might be to treat all as having minimum protection needs as adult citizens. And I think this is a really important principle. Now, in many countries, uh, people in non-standard forms of employment might not reach the thresholds to get benefits. But in most of the countries we were looking at, with Germany the main exception, if you reach those thresholds, you would then get a minimum benefit that is actually, in effect, a, a cross-subsidy towards the low paid and the irregularly paid. So it was not proportional. Uh, the benefit, the minimum level, is not proportional to the amount of contributions paid in. Germany still retains benefit, no, has no floor to benefits, and it's proportional to contributions paid in. And that suggests that there's no notion that it's treating everybody as an individual with certain minimums needs. Um, a third possibility is to expand eligibility for contributions and rights and benefits from employees to self-employed. And we found quite <coughs> wide variations in how this was already treated. Three countries, France, Slovenia and Denmark, already provide paid maternity leave the self-employed. And all but Germany require membership from the self-employed of a pension scheme. Germany is now, has recommended in its recent um, 4.0 um, work 4.0 reports that actually they should change that and the self-employed should join a pension scheme but at the moment that's not the case. Um, a fourth way of imp re reforming would be compensate for the insecurity of non-standard forms of employment. Um, <coughs> Spain and France both provide some extra compensation to those working non-standard forms of employment who made redundant. 
And Spain does something quite complicated in upgrading part-timers' contributions because they count the number of days employed. And you might be employed on relatively few days as a, as a part-timer, so they, they upgrade it now by one point, they multiply by 1.4. So they're compensating for something, although it's partly to do with the complicated way which they do it. And you might compensate for the particular characteristics that cause reliance on shorter or more interrupted and less well-paid employment histories. And here a key example will be care credits for pensions. Interesting, they are very quite generous. They were found in all countries, but they were much more generous than the UK and Germany. And I would attribute that to the fact that mothers were much less likely to be working in the other countries. Um, so they, they needed to be more generous. But nevertheless, they could be, it could be a principle that could be applied more widely. And interestingly, and I'll come, probably come back to this again, there's a very low threshold um, for, mater uh, for maternity leave for those under 26 in Spain, which is an explicit recognition of the insecurity of the youth labour market in Spain, that you couldn't actually acquire the right to maternity leave because of the insecurity. Um, we could reduce non-standard forms of employment, in my view, by flexibilising the standard employment relationship. That means by enabling those in standard employment relationship type jobs to retain their jobs and their careers when they need some flexibility for, to provide for child or elder care. Now, in all the countries, they, you have maternity leave, um, which do, has helped women do that. Uh, and there's also the right to request flexible working in all six countries, and actually in four of those countries it's, it goes further than a right to request. However, there are penalties concerned, and so the second issue would be to enable employee orientated working time flexibility without penalties. Uh, and that means improving the rights to return to full-time work, which are weaker except in Slovenia where it's um, automatic. Um, and also we need to address the fact that many women become trapped in flexible working with their current employer because they can't take that right for flexible working to another employer. And finally we need to do more to provide for second chances and late entry to um, standard employment relationship type jobs and careers, uh, reinforcing age discrimination, providing unemployment uh, opportunities for the unemployed to develop education and skills which they can then use for a second chance. Uh, that contrasts with the UK, where you can't claim unemployment benefits if you're educating yourself. It's uh, seen as a, a reason for removing your benefits. So these are the sort of things we could do. And then there's the... Sorry, I'm rushing because we have a short time. We could remedy the impact um, of these forms of employment by in-work benefits, which addresses the problem of the growing working poor. Uh, and all the countries, to some extent, made some opportunities for people to work. Um, sorry, I'm mixing two things up here. Um, UK, France, and to more limited extent, Germany used in work credits quite extensively as a major element of social protection system. And we also might want to provide opportunities for partial employment un or partial unemployment to limit long term unemployment. And all the countries allowed some greater opportunities for the unemployed to work and claim benefits. And actually, what we're seeing here is that there's, in the UK, France and, and Germany, a kind of um, fusion between unemployment benefit and in-work benefits, taken to a very strong extreme in the UK, where uh, universal credit is about to come in, which is actually abolishing the difference between out-of-work and in-work uh, in benefits. Now, there's some problems with this whole approach. Um, In-work benefits can be seen as a subsidy to employers providing low pay and irregular, uh, who are providing low pay and irregular employment, and they often, certainly in the UK, get or, already get subsidised by not having to pay national insurance contributions. That's not true in Germany on mini jobs. And, yeah. and it also reinforces the distinction between breadwinners and non-breadwinners, as it's, these in-work benefits are household means tested, and it creates disincentives for women entering work and adding hours. It is also part of the coercive approach to the unemployed who are required to take low paid and irregular work as it's topped up by the state. And from now, it, the unemployed in Britain will have to accept zero hours contracts. So let's turn to the final bit, I'm rushing. Um, should we revolutionise social protection by introducing universal bank, bank, basic income? And I've identified three main aims, the end to coercive work, work first approach by the state, which is a strong argument in standing. 
But my problem there is I see no reason why the state should change from a coercive to a benign state necessarily. And even if it does, it may change back again uh, when you change government. So it's not a, a, a fix that lasts, and it may mean that um, in-work benefits are just cut by the new government. It certainly does do things to value all firms of work, including unpaid care work. Um, but the problem is that might encourage a, a, the, and reinforce a gender division of labour, as well as in allowing employers to remain subsidised by people doing casual work on top of the basic income. And finally, it's supposed to empower citizens, but I'm sceptical that it would be high enough to be really empowering. And it removes the coercion, but coercion in the current form is a recent development. It's not inherent around unemployment benefits. So what I'm suggesting, and I'm getting very close to the uh, is key examples of disconnecting social protection from employment where possible, but stopping short of universal basic income. So having health service provision as citizens. Denmark has a citizen's pension. Spain provides its access to maternity leave for, uh, without linking to effectively to employment protection. And I think we should have a UBI for children, as proposed by Tony Atkinson, because this would establish more of a level playing field between men and women in the labour market. You would remove the pressure for um, uh, uh, a family wage. So I think what I'm saying here is that I think under the reform aspect there's still a lot of scope for learning from these best practices. There's much more we can do. We can also do things under the reducing uh, thing to, um, we've made some progress but we need to address some of the issues that are of entrapment of people in flexible employment and we need to do more about second chances. Remedying impact, I think, has major problems. It's subsidising employers, encouraging the development of precarious work. So we need high wage floors, more regulation of employers, and policies to ensure employers pay for social protection. And finally, I've already said, I don't think we should have UBI, but we can do things to improve matters. So I'll leave it there with my slide for you to read. Thank you very much.